Hey guys, um, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Chelsea and I am currently a law student. I'll be graduating this year. Um, one of the greatest things that I have learned about is cold cases and that is what I made this blog for. It was to try to breathe new life into these cases and see where we could go with them. Um, so the first story that I'm starting with, I'm going to go like, I'm going to eventually be all over the country, but this is my first story and I decided to start with West Virginia. Um, so in 1950, there was a woman named Roberta Elam born in Minnesota. And as she grew up, she became very devout in her, in her religious beliefs. Um, she was Catholic and so she had aspired to become a nun. And she actually went to school for religion and everything. I didn't even know that was a thing, but, you know, apparently. So she did. So she did this. And she was really good. Um, and then um, in 75, I believe, she moved to West Virginia. And she came here to actually fulfill her dreams of becoming a nun. Um, so, anyways, we're just going to go ahead and fast forward. Um in 1977, she had one final step left to becoming a nun, and that was a eight-day retreat of silence. And during this time, she was supposed to reflect on her decisions and uh, re reflect on her faith and determine whether this is something that she really wanted to devote her life to or um, if maybe she just wasn't cut out for this. So that was the whole purpose of it. You know, can you devote this to your, your belief or not? Um, she actually went to another nun that was there a, a few days prior to this, and she told this lady, you know, um, I'm not really sure that this is for me anymore. You know, I don't know that I'm making the right decision. And so, the, you know, the other lady, you know, was very polite to her. And she told her, she was like, you know, honey, that's what this is about. That's, that's what you're supposed to be trying to figure out, you know, if this is what you want to do or not. So, um, it goes forward. And be, right before the retreat was supposed to begin, she went to this friend again. And she said, hey, I've got to tell you something. And it is really crazy. Ah, no, maybe I shouldn't tell you. And her friend's like, no, go ahead and tell me, you know, you know, what, what's going on? And she's like, mm, no, it's too crazy. I shouldn't tell you. And that's really just kind of where it left off at. And we'll never know what it was that she wanted to tell her. So June 13th, 1977, she is in her eight day silent retreat. She is now known by Sister Robin, by the way. So Sister Robin grabs an apple and her Bible, and she goes to a hill behind of Mount St. Joseph's. And she's going up there to meditate and pray, <clears throat> something that she done a lot. Well, this time she didn't come back, and so they was, you know, kind of worried about her, wondering what happened to her. So they go to look for her, and when they get there, um, sadly, Sister Robin has passed away, and so they call the police, and when the police get there, the first things that, that the police noted was, for one, she had obviously been violated as her top clothing and her bottom clothing were removed. And two, she had no defensive wounds whatsoever. So they knew that somebody had incapacitated her prior to the other assault. So the more that they're looking at this, um, it, it goes on. Once they do the autopsy, they find out that um, she had, I hate to say this, but she had been strangled um, violently. Um, and they knew that it was by somebody exceptionally strong. Like, they do know that. It was by somebody really strong. But they don't know who. Um, now, here's where things start, like, really taking a weird turn. For whatever reason, the homicide unit was not called in until 10 days later. We're talking about an outdoor crime scene. This outdoor crime scene, 10 days, what they think was going to happen. But this is, this is what they chose to do. 
So 10 days later, this homicide uh, unit comes out there and they find out this was not even cordoned off. People has been allowed to traipse back and forth since this occurred, okay? There is cigarette ashes all over everything from reporters and um, detectives and who knows what. So basically all of the evidence was destroyed. The only thing that they found that was interesting to them was in the foliage to the side of the woods. There was a like indented spot that looked like maybe somebody had sat there. And so they were thinking that maybe the suspect had laid in wait. I'm not being like rude or anything like that, but I, I just kind of want to point out this is West Virginia we're talking about and West Virginia has deer and a deer will bed down like that as well. So I'm not saying that they're wrong in saying that the, you know, the suspects stay there. I'm just saying that we do have other possibilities here too. So we don't really know. Okay. So they start ruling out suspects. Now keep in mind, this is 1977. This is before DNA. What they did have though was enough to prove the blood type of the suspect that they were looking for. So they're kind of like ruling people out by alibis and blood tops. There was, this one keeps coming up and I'm not really sure why it's so interesting and why it's so important that it keeps getting brought up. But apparently there was a man that was trying to get on a train, jump a train the same day that this incident occurred. And so I'm thinking, they, they say that they ruled him out, but I keep wondering like, if he was ruled out and he wasn't anything important, then why does it keep getting brought up that he was a suspect to begin with? You know, I don't understand that. But because there was supposed to have been, like, a lot of suspects that was ruled out. But he keeps getting actually, like, brought up. You know, we don't get to hear a lot about the other ones. But anyways, um, so they finally settle on one... A suspect that they really like and his name is John Shawplack. Now John Shawplack I don't want to be rude, but he was not a good he was not a good guy. He just wasn't. He had um his his flaws and he actually had been convicted of two <clears throat> assaults of this same nature minus the actual death, but he, he was arrested for, he was convicted of two of these assaults before. So for one, I'm wondering like, why don't they have his, if he, if he was convicted, then they should have had his, um, blood sample or whatever. I don't want to say the words, but you all get my picture. Like they should have had the evidence on file, but for some reason they're saying that like they didn't have any way of getting I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand why if he was convicted of these crimes, then why is that information not in the in the system? Because like crimes of that sort of nature, the evidence doesn't get thrown out. That is like any any type of information that they can keep on that suspect, they're going to just in case they offend again in the future. So I'm not understanding that situation, but this is how it happened, okay? That's all I can tell you. So then they um, dig a little bit deeper. He has two girlfriends that comes up at separate times. Okay. One girlfriend comes in and she says he put something around my throat and pulled. Okay. The second girlfriend comes in and she says the same thing, but she adds that he told her that he committed a crime pretty much pretty much what happened to sister robin but he he named a different location and there was another detail that she mentioned that cannot be proved um so i don't know that i'm buying that story i, I just really don't i don't know that i'm buying that story oh and as far as the um i meant to i meant to mention that as far as the other two convictions that he was supposed to have had there is a lot of people who says that he was protecting somebody, that he did not actually commit these crimes, 
that he took the fall for it because the person that was was responsible for it, that he loved them so much that he refused to allow them to <clears throat> go to prison for it. So he just took the fall for it himself. And no, uh, I'm not saying that that's, that that's true or false. I'm just saying that the people who, who state this, they really stand behind this. So it makes you wonder, like, you, you know, you just kind of have to wonder, but so the second girlfriend has come in and she's now made these statements and she's saying, you know, well, he, he told me that he, he done something similar to this. Well, yeah, he may have, I don't know, but he was questioning, you know, like he, he was a suspect in this. So he's liable to have used this story to his advantage to try to scare her to make her stay. We don't know. The, the last thing that she said though, kind of does stand out to me. She said that he was really, really against Catholics. Why? We don't know. But if he did have that kind of feelings toward Catholics, then yeah, that would kind of move him up on the suspect list. However, the cops had ruled him out. And how did they rule him out? They pulled his military records and his military records showed his blood top. And his blood top did not match. So the cops said, okay, this is not him. Now this is where we're gonna jump all the way to 2019. In 2019, now they're saying, <laughs> well, military records was not that accurate. And because military records was not that accurate, <clears throat> we can't rule him out now. We can't not now say that he, he wasn't, you know, that he, he wasn't a suspect. He, I mean, he could have still done this. You're very right. Here's my problem with this. Military records was normally in the 70s was normally created from medical records. So that would mean that his doctor was saying, this is his blood type. And that the military added this to his record and said, okay, well, this is his blood type then since that's what you say. That's not always the case. That is not always the case. That's the reason that there was inaccuracies is because people done it in different manners. Okay, so it's still it's still possible that the blood type that he had listed on his paperwork was accurate. Okay, just stay with me here. Now this is this is what I'm talking about. They're they're so stuck on him and and the problem with him is is John Shaw Black passed away in 2017. When he passed away in 2017, he was in a hospital. Now, they've tried to reach out to this hospital to see if possibly there was any of his samples stored, saved, whatever, so that they could maybe run that DNA test. But he's not here. We're not going to be able to get the answers from him now. Okay, so I can't help but to feel like they got too stuck on a suspect. That That's just the way I feel about it. John Shoplick, he wasn't a good man. He attacked his grandmother. He went to prison for attacking his grandmother. And I mean, he really hurt this woman. He was not a good man. And I'm not saying that he was. But my issue is, is just because you don't like him, just because some of the situations that he's been through sounds similar, does not mean that he was responsible for this situation. As far as I understand, nobody didn't even report him in the area at the time that this happened. So I'm not understanding how they got so focused on this one person. His military record stated that his blood type was different than their suspect. They should have continued to branch out and look for newer suspects. And I'm not saying that they didn't. I'm not. I'm just going by what I can find on this. Okay, so here's where it comes in to where I think that the public can really help there was things that we can still find the answers to. Number one, there was a crew from Georgia that was working in Wheeling, West Virginia at the time, putting up power poles. I'm willing to bet that if any of these men are, um, that, that were on this crew or see this video, they would know of this story. I'm confident of that. It would have been too big of a case back then. So, the thing is, is these individuals was never really ruled out. They, they were never brought forward. These people never talked to the police. They was very close to the, and I'm not saying that they did anything. Mm -mm. 
<laughs> my point is though is the more people that they can rule out the better so these these men that were working from Georgia we don't know one of them could have been involved you know for all we know one of them could have been you know if one person from that crew would step forward and say hey this is who was working there at the time this could help the police to narrow this list down just a little bit further number two there was an individual that was seen in the area at the time. They described him as being in his 30s. And he had dirty brown hair. That's the way they described it. Dirty brown hair. They said that he had larger eyes and big bushy eyebrows. Like, they was, from the picture, like they have a sketch that um, it's kind of hard to find, but if I find it, I'll post it. Um, but they do have a sketch of it, and I mean, like, <laughs> they describe the eyebrows as, like, outrageous. Um, but he was seen in this area. Now, he wasn't found after that. The police looked for this man. They made these sketches, and they said this person is wanted, you know, just to talk to. Like, they, they wasn't going to arrest him. They just wanted to talk to him so that they could rule them out. But this person wasn't seen in the area anymore. They never found him. Who was he? Think back. If you was in Willing, West Virginia in June of 1977, do you remember seeing a man that walked around that looked like this? From what I understand, he was on foot. He didn't have a vehicle. He just kind of walks around and done his thing. Just think back. If you can think about who this might have been, reaching out to an officer and telling that officer who this person was could be a huge help because then the officers can just all they have to do is be able to talk to the person to either rule them out or convict them. And finally, there was a vehicle that was parked. I can't say this word, y'all. I'm going to sound like I'm saying a sandwich. I know I am. The only way I know how to say it is like, like, pogey? Pogey? Po? Po? Pogey? I don't know. It's P-O-G-U-E. They said that it was right near the Mount St. Joseph's. I don't know. But anywho, there was a car that was parked there. The car that was parked there, they described it. Just think back. Like I said, just think back. If you was in Willing, West Virginia in the 1970s, think back because this may trigger something for you. It was either a Chevy or a Buick. They're not really sure which one. But think about the rest of the description. It was rusty. They know this. It was rusty. And it was either a light gray or a faded blue. Okay? This was parked in the area. I assume they were all on the back. But the car was noted to have had several coal mining bumper stickers as well as religious bumper stickers. So think about that. A rusty collared, either light gray or faded blue car with all of these coal mining or religious bumper stickers that has to stand up to somebody somebody knows whose car that was again they don't know if this person was involved or not but it helps to be able to eliminate people as well so i'm really hoping that we get this shared around and possibly get sister robin some justice because she deserves it it's i mean this happened in 1977 y'all it's been long enough. Now, if you have any information that you think could help with this case, the officer to call is Mike Spraldon, and his number is 304-647-7600. Now, you can also call your local um, police department, and you have the right to remain anonymous and if you feel like you should, then please, by all means, be anonymous. But let them know. If, if you're remembering something from this, let these people know. Let's try to be the change today. Y'all take care. Thank you.